Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the WellMed Charitable Foundation Caregiver Teleconnection. My name is Evelyn Grepp. I'll be your facilitator this morning, and we have dear Lucy, who I'm going to tell you a little bit about, who's going to present on what caregivers do when the person with dementia refuses personal daily care. Lucy has a master's degree in social work from McGill University. She is presently working as a consultant for a health network in Montreal, Canada. She's been involved in various research projects and has published numerous articles related to caregiving issues. She's lectured at several universities and colleges on innovative approaches to caregiving and presents annually at international and national conferences. Lucy's also a consultant for private industry in the United States, including her work with the WellMed Charitable Foundation and clinics in Texas. In addition, Lucy would like you to know that she was a caregiver for her own mother for about 10 years. And with that, Lucy, please begin your presentation. And thank you so much for being here today. You know, we love to have you. Thank you, Evelyn. And thank you, Minerva. It's going to help me out with my slides. Uh, good morning, everyone, and, and welcome. You know, in today's session, you will have an opportunity to ask questions, make comments, or share helpful tips from your own experience. But I also want to tell you that after this session, as Evelyn said, I will still be available for an additional half hour if you want to discuss any personal topics. The recording will be shut down, obviously, for privacy reasons. And, and feel free to ask me any questions. As well, what I'd like you to know is that um, you can receive the slides. So maybe you don't have to take as many um, things down. And so just let's sit back and relax. What I wanna tell you is one of the biggest challenges that caregivers um, may face is providing daily care for a loved one, especially if they suffer from dementia. This can be uh, a daily struggle if the person refuses your help. Now, as Evelyn told you, I was a caregiver for my mother for over 10 years. And I have to tell you that I went through those difficult times and it took a lot of information to get myself educated to deal with this. So I'm hoping that today will be a session that will benefit a lot of you. I do receive quite a few emails and questions that are asked of me. I want to share one with you because it really has to do with the topic that we're discussing today. And it goes, Dear Lucy, my husband was diagnosed with Alzheimer's five years ago. I'm his primary caregiver and happy to do so. In general, George is a very calm and gentle man. I assist him in all his daily activities. However, in the past few months, it has become very difficult for me to care for George with his daily hygiene. He's now refusing to take a bath, change his clothes, and refuses to brush his teeth. I'm so angry with him that I just want to give up. I don't know what to do or where to get help. I took him to his doctor who said that dementia has progressed and I need to find new ways to assist George. I'm in my late 70s and find it very difficult. When I get angry, I feel sorry for yelling at him. And the person signed it, please help. So, you know, thank you so much for your uh, email. I think it kind of represents probably a lot of what other caregivers are going through. Uh, next slide, please. I really wanted just to review a little bit of what is dementia. Um, you know, we know what it is basically, but just to sort of put us in the focus of what really affects the brain, it does affect the brain for sure. So there is memory loss, there's difficulties with thinking, problem solving and language, mood and behavior changes, it reduces ability to perform everyday activities and it's irreversible symptoms, that's for sure. So just kind of putting ourselves in that headset, um, just to put us in the sense that the person that we're caring for is no longer the person that they were, and that these difficulties can make it also very difficult for them to be able to, um, to engage in the tasks that we want them to. So let's discuss reasons why some people with dementia display difficult behaviors 
especially when it comes to daily hygiene. It might be a behavior that always existed, it possibly could, or a new situation that as the caregiver you are now facing. So when a person with dementia is unwilling to do something that we want them to do, this may be described as refusal or resistance, difficult to manage, stubborn, and that can make you angry, frustrated, and I can certainly understand. However, as with other areas of a person's behavior that we may find challenging or distressing, we need to try to find out what the person is telling us through their refusal, like why is this happening? In other words, the reasons why they are refusing, and rather than expecting the person with dementia to follow our wishes, we should be focusing on how we can cooperate with their wishes. I know it's a lot to ask, but it's something that we, I personally had to learn how to do. Next slide, please. So let's look at what is happening, okay? The person, uh, when a person with dementia is verbally or not verbally communicating, they don't want to do something. As I said, we need to discover why. So the person may be in pain or have a medical condition that you're not aware of. They could have a urinary tract infection. Maybe they, if they're diabetic, their sugar levels are off. Maybe they're dehydrated and are just very lethargic. The person does not understand what they're being asked to do, as we said, uh, with dementia. The request we're making does not fit with the person's standards and preference. For example, we're asking them to eat something they don't like or asking them to go to bed when they want to stay up. Now, dementia, there's, you know, there's a beginning, there's a middle stages. Even during the middle stages, people with dementia can still, you know, want to do things their own way. The person feels that they're being talked down to or bossed around and is refusing in order to keep a sense of control. And many caregivers tell me that. They say, oh my God, he keeps telling me that I'm bossing him around. The person is misinterpreting the situation or the environment. For example, the person may perceive a shiny floor as being wet and refuses to walk on it. You don't understand why, but they cannot tell you why. They could be tired, they could be hungry, or they need to go to the, to the bathroom. You know, a person with dementia may refuse to fit in with a daily routine that does not fit in with their own, okay? Because no matter what, they're still, you know, they're not, they don't understand that what's happening to them at that point. You know, this can be seen as a positive sign, and I'll tell you why. It may show that the person still has a sense of their own identity and autonomy. It's very beneficial to both the caregiver and their loved one to maintain this autonomy um, and, and um, you know, and independence for as long as possible. People with dementia have good days and they have bad days, and we all know that. So it's so important um, to recognize how the person is feeling that day. If they're having a bad day, maybe it's not a good idea to give them a bath or a shower. It's important to pick your battles, focus on the quality of life. You know, personal care is an intimate activity and most people will experience difficult feelings if they need help with, uh, with hygiene. Um, trying to force a person with dementia to accept personal care may be seen as abusive. However, neglecting someone's personal care needs can also appear to be kind of neglectful and abusive. So what does a caregiver do and how do you move how, and how do we move forward? These are a lot, a lot of questions that we really need to think about. Next slide, please. You know, first and foremost, remind yourself that providing care for someone with dementia requires creativity, patience, and empathy. The ability to step outside of your own personal needs and logic and understand just why certain behavior is happening and learn how to successfully manage it. It could be a hit or miss, so don't stress, 
we have to take it one day at a time. And sometimes we really, really even have to take it uh, one minute at a time. You know, it's, um, and I'm gonna, if you look at the slide again, you know, patience is so important to be creative, how to uh, go about it rather than forcibly, the empathy, uh, and to really look at what is happening, what's going on. As with, as with most things related to dementia, caregiving, dealing with behavioral symptoms requires planning, making things simple, and a lot, a lot of patience. As the progresses, you know, um, of dementia, as it progresses, poor hygiene can become um, a real issue. People living with dementia may refuse, as we see, you know, to bathe, and it can have medical consequences, as I was saying before, such as urinary tract infection. There could be um, bed sores. There could be um, rashes. There could be unpleasant odors. Because dementia causes a slow decline of cognitive functioning, the individual will start to get confused about simple things like how to wash their hair. They may be overwhelmed and confused by all the products and on the bathroom counter, perhaps mistaking a tube of lotion for toothpaste. They may not always recognize themselves or their loved ones. The image they see in the mirror may appear to them as strangers. You can just very well imagine how frightening that can be for someone um, if they don't even recognize themselves. And you know, this is why I sort of started off with let's talk about dementia again, even though you know about it. Because sometimes, you know, they have good days where all of a sudden it seems like really they're not as bad as they appear to be. But we really don't know what's happening inside that person's mind. The other thing that I really want to talk about, and if we can um, go to the next slide, please, that it's important to recognize that sensory perce uh, perception, especially vision, touch, and smell, hearing, and taste, changes as we age. And we know from, um, from research that a lot of it also changes because of dementia. Uh, if they can't see as well, they don't recognize, so things do happen. So let me give you a few examples. Um, a tub of water may seem scary as deaf perception changes. I mean, to them, it, it, it could look, I, they could imagine anything, you know? And sometimes we have to recognize that a smelly shirt may be comfortable, more comfortable than a fresh one. So, and, and they don't wanna take it off. Water temperature may feel different for them than for you. It might seem colder or hotter, not knowing what is happening to them, feeling very confused, okay? Not able to hear your instructions, and that's important. Their taste changes uh, could be loss of taste. For example, you may be giving them an apple and they're telling you, why are you giving me a hot dog? And because in their mind at that point, that is exactly what's happening. So recognizing that is, um, and knowing that and keeping all these things in mind. So, um, so where do you start with all of this? So I've told you about all the things that could be happening and going through them. But at the end of the day, you need to do some of these daily hygiene. You want to bathe, they want to change their clothes, you want to go out. So how do we start? So let's go to the next slide, please. So I'm gonna start by talking about bathing, um, which is, um, you know, helping someone with dementia take a bath or shower can be one of the hardest things to do. Planning can help make that time better for both of you. If the person is afraid of bathing, follow their lifelong bathing habits, such as doing the, ba the bath or shower in the morning or Lucy, can you unmute yourself, please? Yeah. Sorry about, I don't know if I did that, I'm sorry. You know, there's no magic formula uh, that I can give you, only some simple uh, tips, because really as what I'm saying is really gauge where the person is at that day. Not only gauge them, but even yourself. 
Okay, so here are some tips. Um, make sure, um, are, we, are we in, uh, which, are we on slide six? Yes. Okay, so make sure that you have the time and energy to get the task done. That is one of the most important thing. If you get up in the morning that day and you're saying, oh, I have a backache, I'm not feeling well, well, maybe it's not a good day to give them a bath or a shower. And that's okay. We'll talk about things that you could do instead. Look at yourself, because if you're not in a good mood and if you're not feeling great, it's not going to work. Be prepared that things may not work out as you wish. So what I'm saying by that is try not to get angry. Be patient, use clear words, and don't get frustrated or angry. Stay calm and stay focused. Now, I know that's easier said than done. I've been there. I've done that. But I think the whole idea behind that is sort of trying to really put yourself in that scenario and, say, and giving yourself permission to say, okay, so he's not going to have, or she or they will not have a bath today. Uh, it's okay. A sponge might do a sponge bath. And I'll talk about that as well. Can we go to the next slide, please? All right, I wanna really talk about bathing and safety tips. So obviously never leave a confused or frail person alone in the tub or in the shower or in the bathroom. So get yourself prepared. Always check the water temperature before they get in. You know, as I said before, they're, you know, they, they, it might be too hot for them. So just be careful. Use a handheld shower head, use a rubber bath mat and safety bars in the tub. Use a sturdy shower chair to support a person who is unsteady to prevent falls. I mean, these equipments you can get at the drugstore or medical supply store. But what I would highly recommend is that you can get a professional to come in, an occupational therapist or a physiotherapist. And there are even individuals who specialize in that to really take a look at your bathroom and to walk the person through it because you may feel that they're safe to pick up their leg to go into the bathtub, they may not be. And so, and then the bars, um, I think a professional can really adjust the bars where, sh they, where they should go. So that would be extremely helpful. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I want to talk, you know, I'm talking about getting yourself prepared. I'm talking about doing it. So you really have to plan when you're going to give somebody um, or assist somebody in a bathing, you need to be prepared. So it's important to not at the last minute, get the soap, the washcloth, towels, the shampoos um, ready. Make sure the bathroom is warm and well lit. Now, remember, I talked about perception there vision not might not be so good but i do have to tell you that when my mother would be taking a bath uh, i would put candles in the bathroom because she really liked it so sort of developing a spa day play soft music if it helps the person relax i always had music going at the time even when she was assisted by someone else because that sort of made her relax and it's important to be matter of fact about bathing. Say it's time for a bath now and don't argue about the need for a bath or a shower. Don't tell them that they're smelly. Don't tell them that their company is coming. Just tell them that it's time for a bath. Be gentle and respectful. Tell the person what you're going to do step by step. I know that when I uh, go for any procedure, I always tell the doctor, tell me what you're gonna do next because that's important. It reassures the person. Again, the water temperature is so important because if it feels a little hot to you, it might feel like boiling to them. So I would recommend like kind of lukewarm, but if you see that they're really cold, obviously make the water a little bit warmer. Now, I'm sure you wouldn't use bath oil or even a bubble bath. It can make the top slippery and it could cause urinary tract infections. So if they use, uh, if, uh, if they refuse to bathe or shower, as I said before, a sponge bath may be the solutions for you at that time. Now, um, you know, I, I, I do want to talk about um, 
Other bathing tips, for example, um, uh, prevent rashes or infections. Uh, it's very important that after the bath that the person is really very well dried off, especially between skin folds. If the person is incontinent, use a protective ointment around their private parts and try to encourage them to do that themselves if they can, because that will avoid rashes or possible bed sores. For most people, a full bath or shower two or three times a week is really enough. Um, I know we're used to taking a bath every day, but keep in mind that most people with dementia are not uh, going out and are not probably sweating and strenuous. It's really up to you, but it's okay. Um, between baths, again, the sponge bath is fine, the face, the hands, the uh, underarms, genitals, um, you know, all the things that you could do on a daily basis. Washing the person's hair, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, later on, but let's say if they really don't want their hair washed, some caregivers have told me that um, doing it in the sink seems to be a little bit easier um, to do. You could always use a dry shampoo. Um, not on a regular basis, but in between. And please use um, non-stinging baby shampoo, which won't hurt their, um, their eyes. Um, and, you know, in the worst case scenario, and I want to talk about this because I'm going to open up for questions about bathing, is if you feel that you could not cope with this, or if you feel that you're going to injure yourself, please try to get help for the bathing. All right, whether it's private help or through our resources that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. All right, I'd like to open up the lines now if somebody has a question or if you have a tip that you've, that's been useful for you and you want to share it with the other uh, caregivers or whoever is on the line with us. Hey, folks, this Offered. You can use the chat room, you can put your hand up. And if you're on the telephone, I have a little website I can see if you unmute yourself by pressing star six. We'd love to hear from you. As I said before, it always makes the podcast more interesting, and I think informative for other caregivers. Well, you must have covered that one pretty well, Lucy. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. So just think about it. Remember, if there's a personal question you want to ask me, I'll be on later on and you can do that as well. OK, so let's go to dressing and we can go to the next slide. Oh, there's something there on the chat. My mother does not want to be told what to do. When I remind her of shower day, she genuinely. Oops. Hang on a second. All right. She genuinely believes she's already showers daily. Yes, that's a really big problem, you know, and that's why I'm saying to create that that sense of a spa day of going into the into the bathroom if there's candles lit or music. It's challenging, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about that on a more personal level um, after the uh, after this session is over. But it's something that a lot, a lot of caregivers are going through. All right, so if we can go, uh, there's something else. Raise the hand. Somebody raised a hand. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things that I have come across with my husband is um, like when he is, um, his pull up is wet and you're trying to take it off to, you know, give him a shower. He don't want to take it off. So what are some of the things that you can do to help them, you know, help me to be able to take it off? So, you know, I understand. Are you saying that he's wearing a protective pad? Is that it? Yes, ma'am. Like the pull ups, the um, yeah. Yes, the pull ups. That is extremely difficult. And I hope that you stay on the line. I'd like to address that with you. Um, later on, would that be okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay, but just for those who cannot, let's say you have to leave after the hour, I think the best way of doing it is to distract them. 
um, to distract them. Don't pull it off. Don't force them to do that, but distract them. Uh, for example, let's do something else for a while, get back to it, and I will talk more about it later on. Toileting is really very difficult, and I'm working on a session just on toileting, believe it or not, which I will do, I think, sometime in September. All right, let's go to the next slide, uh, slide number 10 on dressing, please. You know, people with dementia often need more time to dress, which makes sense. It could be hard to help them to choose uh, their clothes. They might wear the wrong clothes for the season. They also might wear clothes that don't go together or forget to put on pieces of clothing. You know, it's important to allow the person to dress on their own for as long as possible. And the thing is, does it really matter if something matches or it doesn't match? Remember, I always said, you know, choose your battles. Um, so when possible, as I said, allow them, limit the number of choices to make the decision. That's the key factor. And I have to say, I used that with my children when they were two, because they were very, they wanted to dress. I had to give them choices. Unfortunately, it wasn't easy, but so limit the choices to make a decision. So for example, if you want, if they're wearing a dress, take two dresses out. Pants, two pants or shirts, the same way. Lay out clothing in order it should be put on. Now, remember, I always tell you, you need time. If you don't have time to do this, then just let it go and let them put on whatever they want at that point, if it doesn't matter if they're staying home. Um, so you lay out the clothes in order, put their underwear first, obviously, whatever goes later. It, I found it very helpful to remove extra clothes from the uh, from the cupboard. My mother loved clothes and seeing a lot of clothes really was very confusing. So I put them somewhere else that, you know, and I would change it around. If the person insists on wearing the same clothes every day, try to launder those clothes as often or get duplicates. It's okay. Choose clothing that's easy to wear and care for. Zippers, Velcros are easier than button. Shirts and pants with elastic bands are easier to put on. Label or use pictures to describe the content or dress drawers. What I mean by that is that for some people, we want them to continue doing for themselves as much as possible. So I would label the drawers for underwear. I put a picture of underwear so that you know, my mom was able to kind of see what's in there. It could be helpful to group items of the same color or ones that are worn together, okay? Hang ties, belts, or other accessories on a hanger with matching clothing. Have a basket ready, you know, obviously for soiled laundry to separate the clean ones from the dirty ones. So, I would like to open up the, is it okay? Would you be able to help me, Minerva? If anybody has a question about dressing, which sometimes is difficult to do, now is a good time. Hi, I Evelyn. Can, <laughs> I can help you. For Thank those of you on the line, I'm, I'm not at my own house and I forgot my microphone. So I'm getting, I'm going in and out a little bit and I apologize. But we would love to hear from you. So you know I have a little website and I would love to see you open up your line if you're on the phone by pressing star six. And if you're on Zoom, I think you probably already know what to do. Put your hand up, go to the chat room or just unmute yourself. We really wanna hear from you. I know, um, there is something there. When a person would want to always wear the same sweater or pair of pants, we suggested to the family just to buy many of the same pieces of clothing. Yes, exactly what I sort of said that um, that if they you know if they want to wear the same thing, then just buy additional ones. It's okay. It's the comfort there. Thank you for that. And they may be willing to put it on, even though it's clean. <laughs> exactly, exactly. As I said, sometimes that's something that is a little bit pungent, um, feels a little bit more comfortable because it's cozy. Yeah, dressing is an issue, I remember, because my mom really was loved to dress. And um, it took it, it. And I was happy that she allowed that 
she wanted to do that. I wanted her, I, you know, so I, I chose the time. If I knew her going out, I didn't start dressing uh, like a, a half an hour. I knew it's going to take an hour. So I used to try and really time myself. Okay, so let's go on. We're going to talk about oral care. That's exciting. The next slide, please. Okay. So, you know, proper oral care is important to prevent tooth decay, obviously, gum disease, poor dental health will also affect an individual's ability to eat. Um, and I want to even say a little bit more than that, you know, people don't realize that if you have bad um, dental hygiene, it can affect your whole physical well-being, because, you know, it does transfer in your bloodstream. So, we really need to take care of their teeth. But if someone does have dementia, it's wise to have a complete dental examination early in the disease. Ask the dentist to schedule appointments at times where there, where there won't be too many people in the office. And I have to say that there are some dentists that specialize in patients with dementia. And what I would do and what I did do was I did let the staff know that my mother did suffer from some uh, memory loss and that you have to be extremely patient with her. And I have to say they were very, very accommodating. So here are some tips about like daily care of your oral cow. So remind the person to brush uh, twice a day with a soft bristle, not a hard one, and a fluoride toothpaste. Consider an electric toothbrush only if it doesn't frighten them. You know, it may be easier to use, especially if they have problems with dexterity or if arthritis is an issue. One of the things that's really, really helpful is give step-by-step -step instructions or try hand on guidance or gestures, like either, you know, hold their hand with the toothbrush there and you can actually do it together. Um, but let them do it on their own as much as possible. Obviously be present when the person is brushing, try to make sure that they don't swallow the toothpaste floor or their mouth was. Sometimes it's unavoidable, but it's best that they don't too much. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Minerva. Is it the next slide, please? All right, so I don't know what's happening there, but I'll go over that with you. Uh, try fluoride swaps. If the toothbrush, uh, if the toothbrush is refused, please ask the doctor or the pharmacist first before anything. You can also try regular fluoride treatment at home uh, by using fluoride trays, okay? But please ask the doctor. Now, remove um, partial dentures before uh, cleaning natural ones, obviously. Be prepared for the person to hide their dentures. <laughs> Try to keep them in a specific place at all times. Now, how many of us have not gone through that where the dentures got lost, okay? Now, I'm sure you're all aware that you should remove the dentures at bedtime, clean with a firm brush or place them in water. Obviously, there are these tablets that really do a great overnight job. Make sure dentures are clearly labeled. Why am I saying this, especially if the person is in long-term care? To prevent damage when cleaning dentures, make sure the sink is filled because you never know. You don't want them to crack or the drain is closed, okay? And the toilet lid is shut because accidents do happen. If the person develops dry mouth, try um, sugarless candies, gum, or ice chips to increase the flow of saliva. And again, I um, it, it really don't do any of these things, uh, especially with the uh, with the fluoride before asking. Like I don't know how many states have fluoridated water or not. Uh, and so it's up to you to really get that information. I hope everything is okay with Minerva. Um, can you, uh, uh, Minerva, can you hear us? Ah, there she is, okay. So we went through the slide. Thank you so much for that. Now, remember oral care is really, really important and we cannot neglect it. Now you're gonna be wondering why didn't I talk about dental floss, right? 
how important is dental floss? Um, but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't want to force anyone to, that's a difficult thing to do. Um, if you can, if they can, by all means, if you can do it, by all means, there are these uh, dental flosses that are very easy. They sort of have a handle to them with a little floss on top. So it's much easier to do. I think there was something on the chat because I, if anybody wants to ask questions, Okay, so it says, indeed, excellent idea to have a complete dental examination before the dementia progress progresses too much. At least it gives us an opportunity to act on any priority care before potential resistance or behavior issues appear. I will take good note of that. That's from our friend Andre. Thank you so much for that. Yes, it is so important and so important for us caregivers. I'm not a caregiver presently. You know, we always caregivers, I'm always saying, take care of yourself. And when we say go and have a checkup, go and have a dental checkup as well, you know, every six months or a year. So important for your own physical health. Um, because as I was saying, there's blood flowing over. If you have an infection in your mouth, you might not even be aware of it, or you've got bleeding gums. It affects the, the rest of your body. So if there aren't any questions about oral care, we're going to go and we're going to talk about foot care, which is as important. Okay. You know, as people age, uh, foot care is often neglected because people can no longer reach uh, their uh, feet comfortably and they often can't uh, see to provide proper nail care. This task can be more of a challenge if the person has dementia, okay? So here are some tips that I wanna share with you. So it's important to check the person's feet on a regular basis. Look for discoloration, signs of circular problems, circulation problems, really. So if all of a sudden they're kind of bluish, even the nails um, or any other color, uh, you really need to call the doctor as soon as possible. Calluses, bunions, nail nails. problems, ingrown to, uh, toenail that can cause foot pain reported to the doctor you know if the person's all of a sudden limping and you don't know why they didn't fall and if you haven't checked their feet recently it would be a good time to do that you know check the nail length be careful with nail clippers and scissors if you are uncomfortable trimming nails arrange to have this done at a foot clinic or a professional can come to the house um, and so don't do it on your own if you're not comfortable doing that Again, after bathing, make sure skin between the toes is clean and dry. That's important too. While checking the person's feet, take the opportunity to provide comfort by giving a foot massage with lotion. Isn't that a good way to kind of encourage them? You want a foot massage? Something that they might still remember is enjoyable. Uh, so let's go and have a shower. Let's go and have a bath. A little nail polish often brings a smile. And I want to share with you that one of the best activities that I did with my mother was when I did her nails. I would bring an arrangement of colors of nail polish. She would choose the nail polish that she wanted. And I would sit there for a good hour or more. We would reminisce. She was an amazing cook. And I would sort of, she would tell me about recipes that she made. And it was really, really a nice way to, to engage with her because those things were important to her. And this way, when she got agitated, it was another way um, that I would distract her and, uh, and redirect her. And so I'm just sharing that with you. So about foot care, uh, it's been short. Does anyone have any questions or any thoughts on the matter or any suggestions that you have that you'd like to share with us? So, excuse me, if you're on the phone, press star six, and I have a little website. I can see that you opened up your line. If you're on Zoom, hand up, chat. Um, awfully quiet crowd today. Oh, Andre. Yes, okay. And Andre again, and he said, or she says, as, as an OT, I've always paid attention to the quality of the shoes insoles and whenever possible i would recommend high quality shoes adapted to the specific changes in foot anatomy as we age i'm also involved with compression garments there's a thank good topic you. 
Thank you so much for that. That's exactly what I'm always looking for. As you see, I didn't put that because I don't think in that way. So thank you. I think the proper shoes are so, so important. And su uh, support stockings also are so important. And these are things that you can talk to the doctor as well. Thank you, Andre, for that. Especially on the compression socks when you're traveling, air travel, or just sitting for a long time you know, because of the, um, just the ability, the circulation, it really helps out. So yeah, thank you, Andre. And Andre, I'm going to add it to my next time when I present this topic. Thank okay. you. All right, let's go now. I'm going to talk about hair care a little bit more, even though we did talk about it in, uh, in, in the bath or shower. But what I guess I want to say is that clean, well-groomed hair will make a person with dementia look and feel better. I believe it might not be the case, but for some people it is, especially with my mother, I have to say. So it's also important to choose a hairstyle that's easy to care for. But please don't chop their hair off if they don't want to, you know, <laughs> give them as much choice that it makes life easy for both of you. Uh, and it's encouraged the person to comb their own hair. Uh, if need be, the same thing as brushing is the teeth step by step. You can comb your hair, they can comb their hair. The whole idea behind this is to uh, maintain their independence and their ability to, it's an exercise, a form of exercise to all these things that we do with our hands and our legs, because th that part needs to be maintained. It'll be even easier for you in the long run. Again, I said that before, use uh, non Singing baby shampoo, dry shampoo is okay. If it's difficult, maybe it doesn't need to be washed every week. Try a scalp massage when washing. It may be soothing. That's another way of, uh, you know, you want to get them into the shower. You could say, you know, we're going to have a spa day, have a little massage. Um, it works. And if you really can't get them to wash their hair, or if you can't even do it, we talked a little bit about doing it over the sink or in the kitchen, maybe going to a salon or a, bar a barbershop, if possible, might be the answer. It might be somewhere that they've gone for years and they feel um, they feel connected with these people. It's another, it, it's another way of them interacting with other people. But, you know, and but always, obviously, you wouldn't leave the person alone if they're feeling insecure. But if you do take them to a salon and if the person is notes them and if uh, they say, go ahead, dear, you know, go for a cup of coffee. If something happens, I'll call you. Take the opportunity. Why not? OK, uh, I encourage you to have as much respite and time for yourself as possible. So if there are questions around hair care, then by all means, you can definitely, we can talk about it. Um, but I do want to share one thing with you about one caregiver who said to me, my mom really likes fruit. I found that having a bowl of fresh fruit near, uh, nearby during bath time helped focus on, uh, on her attention and something she enjoyed. As I would shampoo her hair, she began to feel agitated. I would give her a fresh strawberry to eat. This made shampooing easier and a more positive experience for both of us. So that's the whole idea of distracting someone. You want to distract them for the moment. She didn't want her hair washed. The strawberry came, got the strawberry, and then she was able to continue. I love these tips. And I see we've used something. Somebody said Lynn is saying something. We've can used an inflatable hair washing basin that can be used while she lies in bed. Oh my gosh. And I bet you as a, who, if we have an OT on the line, I'm sure that there's lots of gadgets like that. Thank you so much for that. That's a, and I guess, um, I guess you can order that probably on eBay or somewhere. That's a great, great tip. Thank you. All right, let's go to the next one. I just want to talk about a little bit about special tips for men and women. So uh, I know you're going to say who needs makeup, but for those women who used to wear makeup in the past, as my mother did, um, maybe it's okay to continue as long as they don't look like a clown. You know what I mean? Just smearing it all over the face. But I know with my mom, we sort of 
brought it down to just have wearing a lipstick, a nice soft color. And I have to say, it made her feel so good when she looked in the mirror. That's a choice that you can make or not. It's up to you. For some, like uh, we did beauty treatments, for, for example, uh, there's all these um, uh, websites that you could use things in the house like mayonnaise and say, mom, do you want, or dad or sister or brother, do you want to have a little facial? That's another activity that you can do. Again, I spoke about the manicure, how important that was in my relationship with my mother down the road. Um, but I do have to say we had to give up on stockings and pantyhose, which was almost impossible. So I had to look for long, warm socks, which are available that provide warmth and obviously uh, modesty if they if if they didn't want to wear pants. And the reason I'm putting down sweaters, cardigans, or shawls handy as they can bring comfort and security. You know, I talked about the whole sense of. Um, uh, uh, of their their perception and, and their sensory. And um, sometimes I would be boiling hot and all of a sudden my mom would say, I'm really cold. And instead of running around looking for something, I always really had a handy shawl or a cardigan. Uh, and that goes for men as well, or for um, just to be there. So that you kind of, if something does, because the whole discussion today is like really understanding what they're asking us, right? So if, if my mom would get agitated, I would ask her, are you cold? You know, are you cold? Do you need to go to the bathroom? So just keeping all those things in mind was extremely helpful. So if we can go to tips for men, just for a minute, that's the next slide. Okay, so I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to sort of talk a little bit about it. Uh, here we go. Now, if it's difficult to shave the person, I know that I would be, I, I would have a hard time shaving a man. I don't know. It's just not something uncomfortable. And if they're not afraid, I think an electric razor is a good, a good choice. But again, as long as the noise doesn't affect them. It's also important to consider the time of day. It may be best to shave at a regular time or at a time when the person uh, seems most willing, which may vary from day to day, or you don't shave them that day. You know, these are choices that you make. Is it that important to be shaved uh, every single day? Um, and if it becomes really very, very difficult, uh, going to a barber shop for a shave, shave might be the answer for you or have somebody come home. There's a lot of home help services that can come and do that. Last resource is let the beard grow if shaving becomes difficult because a beard you can always kind of trim. It might not be um, the best solution, but it it it's something as the, as the disease progresses, we really need to adapt with the situation. But I have to say that uh, if your loved one used to use perfume or aftershave um, and, and if they want to continue doing that, you know, smell reminds us, it's often reminds us of a meaningful time in our lives. Um, I don't know if you can sort of uh, connect with that, like sometimes a certain smell of cooking brings you back to your grandmother's house or a certain perfume smell brings you to a person that you may have uh, really been fond of but that's a preference you know uh, don't put it on them just because you want them to smell good um, only put it on if they if they themselves don't object to that okay so that that is um, that is something to think about um, you know the whole idea behind this is that dignity and respect rather than becoming angry, frustrated, yelling, or just giving up. I don't want you to give up at all, but you're allowed to get angry. And if you do get angry, step aside, take a big breath, count to 10. Remember what Lucy said, their brain has been damaged. They're not doing this on purpose. It's the disease that's doing it, not them. Um, you know, and try to see things through their lens, which means don't expect your reasoning to matter. Just take a big breath and try again uh, later. If it never seems to work out, you might want to consider a home care aid, you know, to assist you. I also want to tell you that if it's becoming too difficult uh, physically for you, 
then it's time to rethink what you're doing. You know, I always tell caregivers that you need to care for yourself. It's very important for your mental and physical well-being. We all need a balance in our lives by reducing our stress, by exercising, eating well, sleeping well, taking deep breaths, staying connected to others, don't isolate yourself, and don't forget to pour yourself a nice bubble bath and soak off some of that caregiving stress away as well, okay? Do that for yourself. If things get difficult, make an appointment with the doctor as soon as possible. There may be reasons why the person is behaving in this manner. They may have a urinary tract infection, their medication may need to change, the dementia has progressed. Please keep in mind, if the person you are caring for becomes verbally or physically aggressive, you need to put a plan in place, okay? Make sure that you can call a friend or family member to assist you. If the person cannot be controlled, you may need to call 911 because they can become very aggressive. There are resources in your community to support um, both of you. You can call your area agency on aging. The tri uh, triple A's um, is a good is a good uh, is a good way to go. If we can go to back to the uh, slide 17, please, for just a moment. So final hygiene notes. Establish a routine time around hygiene. What I mean by that, establish a time when you have the time to do it, okay? If you're not, then don't. Keep it simple and as pleasant as possible. You can look at it as spa days rather than saying, let's take a shower. Let's do a spa day with the candles, the music. Try and think things through their lens. Use humor and music. Humor is amazing. Music is great. It really changes the perspective. Be patient and don't strain yourself. Remember, full baths or showers three times a week is really enough. And even if it's twice a week, sponge bathing is appropriate as well. So I'm kind of looking at the time, and I see that is we're <laughs> we're running, uh, uh, you know, we're running a little bit. We're not late. We're good because um, Evelyn has things to say. I want to remind you that um, after Evelyn finishes, we're going to close the recording. We're going to take a two minute break to go to the toity, and then I'll be back for an additional half hour with personal questions. It's all yours, Evelyn. <laughs> Thank you. We have a couple chats for you, Lucy, sure. which for everyone, actually, because they're great. My mom always loved clothes with sequins and shiny details. It worked till the very end, smiley face, just as sweets and desserts and her favorite perfume. Oh, thank you. Like my mom. I really connect with you. Sounds like my mother. And then Susan says, Andre, sweet. I can see her parading around smiling. You are wonderful. <laughs> so that was really nice. So, yeah, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the stuff that's coming up, but First of all, I want you to know that you'll be getting a post-session questionnaire. It's really important to us that if you have the time, if you can, if you have the energy, please fill it out and let us know how we did. Um, please don't mention my lack of connection today. Oh, you can do it. <laughs> anyway, what we would like to do is to have you tell us how to, how to keep doing, how to keep improving our sessions or even making suggestions for future topics. And if you're registered, you will get that post-session questionnaire in a couple of days. If not, you won't be getting it unless you call our customer service representative, Minerva the Great. And you can reach her at 866-390-6491. That's 866-390-6491. And we really hope that you'll do that because what you'll also get, along with the uh, resources from today and the slides, will be the monthly calendar on a, well, on a monthly basis telling you about all this incredible stuff that Wellman Charitable Foundation has set up for, you know, caregiver education, as well as support during the month, every month. Uh, this month, we still have some good ones left on Friday. We have in Spanish um, the difference between palliative care and hospice care. On next Tuesday, why family caregivers should say no. 
On next Thursday, we have Help, I'm a People Pleaser and It's Killing Me. Good title. And then on Tuesday, the 25th, Current Issues in Long-Term Care, and that's with Elliot, Montgomery Sklar, and Dear Lucy, and we hope you will join us for that. So with that, I am going to um, close the recording, and I want to thank you all so much. I want to thank the WellMed Charitable Foundation for all the stuff they do for caregivers. Lucy, you always do a, a great job. Thank you so much for your work and energy and preparing this today. And I hope you all realize how much of your input she has combined into her slides, which is why we love to do this. Uh, and we hope that you all will join us again very soon. And we want to thank you for what you do every day as a caregiver. And with that, I will stop the recording. And maybe Minerva already stopped it. Stop.